Okay, welcome everyone and um, thank you for being here to hear about embedding equality, diversity and inclusion in your funding application. So I'm presenting on behalf of myself. Um, I'm a Senior Qualitative Research Advisor at RDS East Midlands and I'm also the co-lead for the national priority work on equality, diversity and inclusion in the RDS. And um, also involved in this work is Dr Chris Newby, Senior Statistician in the East Midlands um, and he co-leads this work um, with me and we've also had some public contributors involved who I will um, acknowledge um, later on. Okay, so what um, I'm going to do in this session is to take you through a bit of an introduction to what we mean by equality, diversity and inclusion, which I know that for some of you that will be very familiar, but for others it might be a little less familiar, and then to kind of focus on why we need to think about this in the context of um, your research applications, um, you know, what the kind of the case is, the scientific case um, for, um, for embedding EDI. And then I'm going to introduce you to the NIHR's EDI requirements, which is something that you all need to think about in your applications and the resource that we've developed, the RDS um, EDI toolkit um, to help you to address and go beyond those requirements. Um, and I'll take you through the different elements of that. And then I'll be around, obviously, for the rest of the um, retreat. So I'm happy to have kind of one to one discussions with teams because a number of these issues are quite specific to the particular context of your research. So what do we mean when we talk about um, equality, diversity and inclusion? Because uh, these three terms get used as a bit of a homogenous mass, but they actually mean quite different things. And just to complicate matters further, we're also seeing a bit of a shift at the moment from the language of equality to the language of equity. So I'll mention that as well. So these definitions have been um, have been written by Dr. Esther Makuka, who is the head of EDI for the um, NIHR. And she focuses on kind of equality being about making sure that everyone has equal access to resources and breaking down some of the systemic barriers that stop that equal access. It's also about making sure that everyone has equal opportunities to use the, uh, to use their talents. Whereas diversity is about making sure that we're reflective of the um, wider community or population, which you know what we're trying to be representative or reflective of might depend on the context of your research. And it's also about making sure that people from a broad range of backgrounds are involved at each um, stage and at each level, um, in this case of a research project, but it might relate to an organization or a team, um, for instance. But what's really key to acknowledge is that um, we can have diversity, we could kind of um, uh, encourage um, having a kind of a mix of people from different backgrounds, but without inclusion, that diversity is tokenistic and it can become very difficult to retain that diversity. So inclusion is making sure that everyone who's involved um, feels that they're valued, feels that they're listened to, um, feels that they can meaningfully contribute, that they um, belong, that they're respected. Um, and it's making sure that everyone has the opportunity to kind of achieve um, their, their full potential. So inclusion is really the key word here when we're thinking about what we're trying to achieve um, in, in research and how we describe that. Because often um, what we see is that it's being acknowledged um, by research teams that EDI is something they need to acknowledge. So they talk about wanting to recruit a diverse sample, wanting to recruit a representative sample. But actually, if you're not developing inclusive strategies to do that, then it's probably not likely to be a successful approach. And I mentioned equity. Um, equity is kind of moving us away from the idea that equality is about kind of treating everyone the same and making sure that everyone has the same. And equity is a more justice focused approach that's about meeting people's different needs and recognising that because of kind of historic um, disadvantage, prejudice, marginalisation, different groups might need different types of resources or maybe a disproportionate um, amount of um, resources um, rather than everyone has the same. So within um, the national priority work um, and within the wider NIHR, we've defined um, EDI not just in relation to the protected characteristics. Um, the protected characteristics are, are on the slide and there's nine of them. Um, but actually, there's quite a lot that we miss out if we only focus on the protected characteristics. 
So we're also um, needing to attend to social class or socioeconomic status, which is one of the, you know, probably the prime determinant really of, um, of inequalities. Thinking also about caring responsibilities, whether that be for children um, or for um, adults and thinking about neurodiversity, how that might impact how we need to um, communicate um, and, um, and, and develop inclusive approaches, literacy, and also the language that um, NIHR is very much using at the moment is that of underserved communities. Um, not everyone likes that terminology. It's not necessarily the terminology that people who belong to so-called underserved communities um, would prefer. And, and Jenny talked um, really helpfully about kind of terminology um, earlier, but that is quite dominant language that you'll see in funding specifications. And there's a whole kind of initiative called NIHR Include, which has a webinar that kind of lists a very wide range of groups of underserved communities. So that might include prisoners, homeless people, um, refugees and um, asylum asylum seekers, um, traveller communities, um, and, and so on and so forth. And geography is also a key consideration, and there's two elements to geography. One is acknowledging that research funding um, historically and, and still hasn't been equally distributed. So we tend to see that certain regions or certain universities um, are disproportionately represented. Some of you will have heard about kind of the golden triangle, where um, a lot of, well, a vast amount of research funding goes to London and Oxford and Cambridge um, and that can mean that there's um, big parts of the country that are really very um, underrepresented in terms of their opportunity um, to be involved in research and for people to take part in research in those areas. So some of it is about kind of recognising those geographical issues, also recognising that research is often concentrated in major urban centres um, and in sites that are used to hosting research and there's a real need to try and um, spread that out so that there's a more equitable um, equitable kind of opportunity to host and participate in research and recognising too that often rural areas and coastal areas are overlooked when it comes to um, to research and yet there can be significant health and social and care inequalities in those areas. And another aspect to be mindful of is that the NIHR is very kind of aware that career stage and sector um, can have an impact on um, opportunities to be involved in research and to develop research capacity. Um, and so social care and public health are both recognised as sectors where there's a need for that extra investment um, and input to try and, um, yeah, to try and bring more research from those areas in and provide opportunity. So in terms of um, why it matters, um, it's it's kind of, it's a difficult question in a way, or it's an easy question or a difficult question, depending on how you look at it, that we could simply say there's a moral imperative to make sure that our research is inclusive and we could just stop there. Um, but in some cases, you know, there's also uh, a need to be a bit more persuasive about why we need to do this. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that there's also a strong business case and a strong scientific case for making sure that research is inclusive. So there's a few elements of this. And first of all, that our research needs to identify and target um, those geographies and those populations where the need is greatest. And often that doesn't happen. So often where research is conducted because of the geographical issues that I just mentioned are actually not the areas where services are most under pressure um, or where the prevalence of particular issues is greatest, where waiting lists are, are longest and, and so on and so forth. And so we need to kind of um, really sort of be, you know, make a concerted effort to move away from um, relying on perhaps sites that are um, already set up, easy to kind of access and convenient um, and to, to kind of broaden that out. But that takes time and, and that needs to be budgeted for. The other aspect is to make sure that we um, are kind of challenging and transforming research practices which um, are oppressive by their nature and which lead to people being excluded from research. And often those people that are excluded from services are the same people that are excluded from research. And there are issues of kind of trust there that are really significant um, to overcome um, and um, and yeah, thinking about how to kind of be creative um, and how to be reciprocal and, and kind of break down power relations is, is crucial. 
We also need to make sure that you know, in the NIHR, um, research is all funded by taxpayers' money. We need to make sure we're avoiding research waste um, by not carrying out research with very homogenous samples that then aren't generalizable or transferable to a wider range of, um, of contexts um, and to the, the wider population. And part of this is making sure that we actually know who's taking part in the research. Um, because often um, you know, the sample might have been diverse, but we simply don't know enough about it to be able to make that call. Um, so I'm, I'm using a health example here, um, but um, something that was quite stark really was that in um, around June 2020, um, Sean Trowick and colleagues um, wrote a paper about the um, COVID um, trials that had kind of amassed so far, and there were 1,500 that were registered on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and only six of them were collecting data about ethnicity. And you think by that point in time, it was kind of well known that there was a relationship um, between, um, between COVID outcomes and um, mortality um, and particular ethnic groups. Um, and so the fact that all of these trials were not actually able to speak to that was you know, a huge, huge issue. So yeah, is that data being collected there to be able to make that kind of that, that judgment? We also need to know whether some groups of people might be adversely affected by a new policy, a new intervention, a new service, even if it works for the majority of people. And a good example with this is the kind of popularity of um, digital interventions now um, and how that can be very um, effective for um, a wide range of people. Um, but actually, you know, there's the issue of digital exclusion um, that Jenny mentioned earlier, that's really key for us to think about that what happens when the only way of um, finding out about services, the only way of communicating um, with services uh, or monitoring um, your kind of well-being is through um, a device that requires internet um, access. Um, how is that actually going to increase um, inequalities uh, for some groups? So being mindful of that. And finally, um, we need to make sure that we're avoiding harm um, by developing interventions. And when I talk about interventions, I mean that in the broadest possible way that have been tested um, and developed with a diverse sample. Um, and so often I give, um, often I'm giving this presentation more in a health context, um, but in a social care context. So a lot of my research um, relates to domestic violence um, and the kind of dominant um, risk assessment tool that's used by the police and other agencies has been designed really with heterosexual women who are being abused by heterosexual men in mind. And because of that, um, the way that that risk assessment is scored and the way that some people would then go off in to um, going to America and receiving kind of higher level um, support um, and, and there's rationing of support in domestic violence agencies um, so sometimes it's only available to high risk cases means that you know if you don't have children um, then it's quite hard to get into the high risk category even if in every other respect you know you're scoring highly but it's just the way the scoring system kind of works that it's really difficult to get into that threshold similarly um the there aren't there isn't kind of consideration of some of the particular um, ways in which perpetrators might um, exploit other protected characteristics such as disability um, such as um, such as gender identity um, or socioeconomic status um, for instance or um, citizenship um, status and so again that isn't going to necessarily flag up um, in a risk assessment as something that um, that could really, really heighten um, someone's risk and entrap them in that relationship. Um, and, and that's still, you know, that's always widely used and hasn't really been systematically evaluated. So in um, May 2020, um, the NIHR um, released some kind of EDI requirements, which now need to be um, factored in when you're writing your application. There isn't a specific section to talk about EDI, so it's just part of the standard um, research plan. And, and as Jenny was saying with public involvement, um, I'd really encourage you to try and make sure that EDI is something that you weave through every section of the application, you know, starting with the rationale and, you know, why you've chosen these particular research questions, your research aims, through your research design, through your 
public involvement through how you describe your research team um, and so on. So every part of the application. But in terms of the requirements, um, what they stated is that everyone should have the opportunity to um, take part in um, research, regardless of all of these different characteristics. So these are the characteristics um, which I've already outlined. Um, they also include access to um, health or social care within that. They also say um, that applicants need to document how they're collecting information on EDI. So what kind of data are you going to collect and how will you collect um, that data? Um, that can sometimes feel a bit challenging because, you know, often the kind of response that um, we get when we talk about this is that ethics committees um, can have can be resistant to certain types of data, protected characteristic data being um, collected. But it's really important that we justify why this is important to actually contextualise um, the findings of the research and to make sure that research and its impacts are as inclusive as possible. There's also a requirement to demonstrate how EDI characteristics have been um, considered um, in the research proposal and to um, and to kind of say what you're going to do to make your sample as representative of the relevant population as possible. And this is also about making sure that you kind of justify any exclusion um, criteria. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. They suggest carrying out an equality um, impact assessment. Um, and so um, the EDI toolkit is, is an example of something that you can use to kind of help you to do that. But the NIHR have their own equality impact assessment um, resource. I think it's kind of in a bit of it. It's transitioning from a previous version to a new version at the moment. But our East Midlands also provide support with equality impact assessment. And there's also a need to make sure that you've considered um, the kind of widest range of potential locations to recruit um, participants and that research is deliverable so, to those sites. So that's again, you know, not just using tried and tested sites, but trying to broaden um, that out. So um, what we did in the RDS was to develop a toolkit to help researchers to meet these requirements and to go beyond um, these requirements. And we, um, it was Chris and I who led this, but we worked with uh, a small group of public contributors and we we're also supported by the wider um, national um, RDS EDI group, which I co-chair. And um, this was a resource that was particularly intended for researchers and research support professionals such as RDS advisors. Um, and we are in the process of working with public contributors to develop some more public contributor facing um, resources, though in our region, public contributors have been using the EDI toolkit and have received training um, on using that. And, um, and we've received really valuable feedback from them. So the toolkit has eight domains um, that kind of cover each stage of the research process. And um, these are the eight domains. Um, so you can access this online. It's on the SharePoint site, the RDS EDI toolkit. Um, so you click onto each um, of these boxes and then it comes up with some key questions, some guidance, lots of useful references, some case studies and, and key messages. Um, so it's really up to you how to use it. You might want to kind of go through all of it. It's quite a lot to read in one go, or you might just want to dip into it where it feels most relevant to your project. And that's what I'd recommend really once you've made yourselves familiar with it. So we have historical context and structural inequality, public involvement, research team, selection of participant sites and samples, data collection, data analysis and presentation, dissemination, implementation and impact. And then there's a final domain that we added after the initial pilot, which was budgeting for inclusion. Because people were saying, yeah, this is great, really want to do this. How much is it going to cost? And are the funders actually going to you know, recognise and appreciate these additional costs? So we provided some guidance there. So I'm going to um, kind of take you through each of the um, domains, but um, I haven't presented this to a sort of social care specific audience um, before. Usually I've presented it to kind of more mixed um, audiences and we're due to do um, a toolkit kind of refresh in the summer. So I'd be really interested in kind of hearing your thoughts um, afterwards um, or whenever it's convenient around, you know, is this resonating for you um, as, as you know, people who are involved in social care um, research or, um, you know, what else could be done to kind of make it um, make it resonate more? So the first domain is historical context and structural inequality. And here what we're focusing on is to try and make sure that as researchers, we don't repeat the ways in which particular groups and communities have been marginalised in previous research. 
So some of this is about knowing who has taken part in previous research, which groups have been um, assumed to be kind of the dominant norm, which groups have just been invisible, not part of previous research, or maybe just not disaggregated in the analysis. And so that really comes into your literature review. And that could actually from there help to drive research questions and priorities in terms of recognising where the gaps are um, in terms of um, inequalities. So when you describe um, the um, how widespread a particular issue is when you kind of explain what the problem is in that first section of your application um, or the second section of your application, wherever it fits best, you know, provide some information about the inequalities, dimensions um, and how um, your research is going to address the inequalities aspects and have, a, have an impact there. It's also being aware that certain kind of historical and structural um, inequalities, historical atrocities have an impact on how people feel about participating in research. And there, um, for, for you know, many people, um, they may be mistrusting of services, whether that be social services, whether it be um, whether it be the criminal justice system or health um, services, um, and that mistrust of services can often then extend to being mistrustful um, of researchers and not feeling that researchers have their best interests at heart or have good motives. And so we need to be mindful of that. And that can be difficult when, you know, you're all coming at this with really good intentions in terms of the research that you're wanting to do and the change you're wanting to bring about. Um, but that isn't going to be instantly apparent to the different groups that you need to involve. And so kind of sustained community engagement is absolutely key. Thinking about developing partnerships maybe with um, community engagement workers who are costed um, to be part of your research, maybe recruiting and training peer or community researchers um, to help to kind of bridge the gap between the research team and the communities that you wish to engage with. So um, public involvement then follows on um, kind of well from that. So this section was um, co-produced with our public contributors and um, Beauty Schumer, uh, Pam Reese and Cecily Henry. And it was them who identified the questions that they really wanted researchers to think about when they were thinking about their, their public involvement strategy. And so the first aspect of this is how aware are researchers, um, how aware are you as researchers of EDI issues in public involvement? So making sure that, you know, they wanted to see that researchers were educated um, and had kind of taken time to learn about the different communities that they wanted to engage with, that they understood some of the barriers that needed to be overcome. Um, they also um, wanted um, kind of researchers to show that they'd considered um, how much public involvement or what type of public involvement would be appropriate. Um, and so thinking about the, the pyramid that, um, that Jenny shows earlier, wrong way, um, that, you know, that is it just about consultation, which is really the lowest kind of threshold um, of, you know, it's not really involvement. It's more kind of like, this is what we want to do. Can you rubber stamp it for us? Um, is it a more kind of collaborative approach? Is it kind of going into co-production or user generation or emancipatory um, methods? What's going to be most appropriate to engage um, with the communities and, and to make sure that they feel um, fully part of the research? Um, but bearing in mind that if you are going to go for um, more of a co-production approach, that NIHR want to see that that's genuine co-production, which means people need to be involved now. It's not co-production if you wait until you get the funding and then um, get people involved to kind of make a few tweaks. Um, and that takes time. And so that needs to be costed for. And there's also about recruitment and retention. So often a multi-pronged approach to recruiting public contributors will be really important so that you're kind of going to a number of different recruitment um, sources to get diversity. And that diversity might be about different protected and other EDI characteristics. It might be about having a mix of people who are quite new to public involvement work and those who are more experienced. Um, and um, it, it might be about kind of diversity of um, lived experience or geographical um, kind of perspectives. So having that, that multi-pronged approach is key. Um, and then the, the third aspect is supporting and empowering um, your diverse public involvement group. And some of that is about kind of neutralising power relations. What steps are you going to take um, to do that? 
how might you as researchers need to put yourselves out of your comfort zones in order to um, to kind of really meaningfully engage um, and engage on the terms of the communities that you're um, that you're wishing to involve. So that might involve costing for um, rooms in community venues. Um, it might involve kind of having a mix of kind of social activities uh, or recreational activities that are part of the um, public involvement um, approach and thinking about training and support needs as well and thinking about accessibility, provision for childcare and respite care. And then in terms of research teams, so this is one of the most sensitive issues um, to talk about, really, um, because it, it feels, you know, it feels much more safe, I think, and comfortable to talk about the diversity of your sample or perhaps the diversity of your public involvement group than to think about you as a research team and what you all bring. Um, but it is recognised that having a team with um, a diversity of lived experience, diversity of characteristics um, makes for, you know, more um, effective um, kind of working. It can it could be more difficult at first because you're kind of coming with different norms and different assumptions and different experiences. But actually that kind of experience of having some friction um, of realising that you're seeing things from really different perspectives can then lead to more kind of relevant um, and holistic kind of solutions and creative approaches. Um, we're really keen to emphasise here that this isn't about having a quota approach of making sure that you're ticking off different protected characteristics in your research team. It's also going to matter in some projects um, more than others that there is a member of the research team um, who has um, lived experience or shared protected characteristic in common um, with the groups being studied. Um, so in my experience, a lot of my research has been on domestic abuse in um, LGBT um, plus communities. And for some participants, not all at all, but for some participants, it's been really important for them to know about my sexuality um, before they've agreed to take part in um, an interview. And I wouldn't have got some of those interviews if I hadn't been willing to be open um, about that. And so it's just being mindful of that. And it's difficult because, you know, sometimes as researchers, we feel like we don't want to have to sort of share every aspect of our identity um, with participants, but then we're asking for a lot from them. And so there is um, an argument for that to be reciprocal. That said, just because you do have a shared protective, shared characteristic in common, um, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have cultural competence um, or a wider understanding of the nuances or intersections um, between, um, between the different identities that are at stake or the issues that affect um, the wider community. So cultural competence is absolutely key um, for all team members. Um, and cultural competence is often kind of thought to be linked to ethnicity and religion. Um, but actually, you know, it's much broader than that. We can think about that in, in the context of a whole range of different communities um, that we work with. And it's also about ensuring that um, we're not just having people there to kind of make up numbers and to give the impression of diversity, but that people can be meaningfully involved and have a voice um, in making decisions about um, research. And that's absolutely critical. Um, so it's it's a challenging one and it's kind of quite specific to your particular topic. But there are things that you can do in terms of you know, similar with one of the previous domains, peer researchers, community engagement workers, um, sustained um, community engagement and public involvement to help to make sure you've got that diversity of perspectives. Um, but it is it is worth consideration in terms of your research team and, and the expertise that you have to be able to develop the relationships that you need to do. So the um, next domain is about how you select your participants and sites and samples. And it's really important that um, you show um, what you're going to do to make sure that your findings will be generalizable or transferable um, to, um, to a wider range um, of people and settings. Um, in some types of clinical trials, there's kind of been a historical sort of understanding that you need to get a really narrow sort of homogenous sample early on just to kind of prove efficacy um, and then if it works we can look at bringing other people in but it's actually quite a problematic approach because it's you know it can lead to research waste um, and we need to be trying to be inclusive from the start rather than just kind of trying to do this additive approach later on um, so some of this comes back to again how you're going to collect data 
about EDI and there are a number of resources um, out there to help to um, guide how to ask um, questions about different protected characteristics. So there's something called the DAISY guidance that's really useful because going to the government kind of categories for um, protected characteristics isn't always kind of the best approach um, to use, uh, particularly when we look at questions like sexual orientation and, and gender identity, that there are more sophisticated ways of asking those questions. Um, there's also the issue of kind of geograph geographical needs, um, which I've talked a bit about already. Um, but really thinking about choice of sites. And so if you're going to have multiple sites, um, how are you going to make sure that you get a range of settings, perhaps rural and smaller towns um, and larger cities, um, different parts of the country, um, different levels of need um, and pressure on services maybe. Um, you know, it's really about the specifics of your project and making that case so that you get a good spread. And, and are you excluding anyone? So sometimes there are good reasons to exclude um, people from particular um, research projects. Uh, it might be that you need, you need to um, fulfill certain criteria to be able to participate. Um, it might be that you do need to exclude people who don't have access to the internet because it's a it's a digital um, it's a digital intervention or a digital study. Um, but then you need to acknowledge what the implications of that are. But sometimes we see kind of quite arbitrary exclusion criteria. If you're not able to consent in English, that's it. You're not allowed to participate in the study. Um, and increasingly, this is seen as unacceptable by NIHR and they, they want to see, you know, what you're actually going to do to be able to consent people and include people um, in languages other than um, English. Um, what I would say is be cautious about just taking that out as an exclusion criterion, but then not explaining what you are actually going to do if, um, you know, when those situations um, arise. And so the next domain is about data collection. And when we started out working on this domain, uh, we were thinking about, you know, how existing approaches to collecting data can be made more inclusive. So what can you do to make questionnaires, focus groups, interviews um, and so on more inclusive? How can we vary the timings of activities? How can we look at format and how accessible different formats are? recognising the cultural sensitivity of some topics that in some instances um, and with some groups it's not going to be appropriate to have mixed sex focus groups um, for instance um, or um, yeah recognising that sometimes it's better to have matched um, kind of to have interviewers that are matched by gender um, or ethnicity in other cases it's that doesn't work so well um, but it started to feel that we were just tinkering at the edges, really, of methods which, by their nature, can be quite exclusionary because they're very reliant on um, verbal and written communication. They perhaps require quite a lot of confidence to just turn up at a focus group when you wouldn't know anyone else there. Um, and so what we encourage um, in the toolkit is to think about more participatory and creative approaches and in innovative strategies. Um, and so it might be that in the context of your um, projects, perhaps thinking about arts based methods or photo voice, photo elicitation interviews um, might be really good ways of um, being able to kind of neutralize some of those power relations, and be less dependent on written and verbal communication and make it a more enjoyable um, and appealing research experience as well. And then data analysis and, and presentation. So in more kind of um, sort of traditional quantitative research and particularly in um, clinical kind of trial based research, what we often see is table one in um, a journal article and table one lists all the sample characteristics. So you find out you know, what proportion um, of, of people are in the different kind of categories for sex or gender, ethnicity, and usually that's kind of the limit of it um, really. Um, but that's it it ends there they don't those characteristics don't come back in later in the article um, and what we're really kind of encouraging researchers to think about in um, in the toolkit is how you embed EDI into your analysis, whether that's quantitative analysis or qualitative um, analysis. And with quantitative analysis, we would encourage that um, there's some consideration given to doing some exploratory subgroup analysis. Sometimes that can feel a bit controversial. Um, we're not saying that um, that analysis will be powered to detect significant differences. It's about it being exploratory. It's about making sure that that data is presented for other researchers and for participants to be able to see. 
Um, and it also might just flag some areas of difference that need to be explored um, in further research or before you kind of move forward um, into um, implementation. Um, in terms of qualitative analysis, um, it's really important to kind of to again sort of look out for negative cases to kind of look out for what the typical um, findings and experiences and perspectives are but then where we have kind of those perspectives that kind of deviate um, is that just down to chance or are there actually patterns there in terms of um, in terms of people's different identities um, and social and geographical locations it's also about making sure that we've got a number of different voices inputting um, into data analysis. Um, and, um, and this again comes back to kind of diversity of your public involvement group, diversity of your team. It's quite easy for unconscious bias to shape how we're understanding research findings and kind of interpreting those findings, what we choose to focus in on, what we don't choose to focus in on. Um, and so having that range of perspectives um, and that kind of verification or checking um, from different sources is, is really key. And what we need to think about too is how we describe um, participants' um, EDI characteristics. Um, and so, you know, language and terminology is absolutely key. It's also changing all of the time. So there have been phases of terms such as BME or BAME being um, kind of quite commonplace terms, but there's been a lot of pushback and resistance to using that kind of language now. And the idea that it sort of homogenizes a huge amount of diversity. And so we discourage you from using those terms. Panels often come back and say they're not so keen on that terminology. Um, similarly, you know, we kind of see different ways of talking about terminology for sexuality um, and gender identity, and there can be a lack of consensus around what terminology is appropriate. So, yeah, as Jenny mentioned earlier, public involvement kind of perspectives on, on language and terminology is really important, but don't necessarily expect to get full um, consensus. And then in terms of um, dissemination and implementation and impact, um, I'm not going to say too much about impact because we've got more input coming on that um, later this afternoon from Alison. Um, but dissemination, um, it's important in your research plan at stage one to talk about your dissemination strategy. Um, not just papers and conferences, um, and, but to think about how you're going to um, make it accessible to um, participants and to communities more widely, to the different um, practitioners and stakeholders involved. So maybe thinking about more creative approaches such as infographics, um, short videos. Videos are quite useful because they can be um, made more accessible um, using captions um, or um, translated into other languages. Um, and thinking about kind of animation. So I've seen some really good examples of animation and illustration and even using that. I saw an example on Twitter last week of an illustrator who'd, um, who'd kind of visually represented um, meeting minutes um, rather than just having this very text based approach. And it's just fantastic. And it just draws you in in a different way compared to looking at, you know, four pages of, of A4 writing. Um, so yeah think about how you're going to do that thinking about who's going to help you um, to make sure that you um, that your findings can reach um, the widest possible um, audiences and, and readerships and thinking about implementation um, so in, in implementation um, studies or as you prepare for implementation being mindful of the EDI aspects of that um, particularly if the original research hasn't been carried out um, with a very diverse sample then it's going to be really important to attend to some of the challenges of, um, of rolling that out in different settings maybe in rural settings that have a very different kind of public transport um, um, infrastructure for instance and really what we are looking for is to make sure that those who are in greatest need benefit most from um, research. So what is the trajectory to doing that? Um, how is your research going to have a meaningful um, and ultimately kind of measurable impact on um, addressing social and care and health um, inequalities? So how much is all of this going to cost? It's the million dollar question. Um, and so 
yeah, we developed the final domain because of concern about costings. We've had some steer from um, panels um, who've said that they are willing to meet what they kind of have described to us as the reasonable costs of inclusion. They emphasise the importance of justifying the costs really clearly. And um, yeah, we would certainly encourage you to really emphasise how you're budgeting for EDI to show that it is there. Um, especially at stage one where you're not providing detailed costings and why this is important. What are the implications of not having these costs um, and considerations in your budget? And what we do in the toolkit um, helps you to look at this in terms of your particular projects. This is all quite project specific. So we map for each of the domains some of the potential costs and some of the potential time implications. And it's actually the time implications that are most expensive, really, because, you know, factoring in things like translation and interpretation or hiring community venues. Yes, they're added costs, but they're not going to be the, the sum of money that taking an extra six or 12 months to recruit um, would be. So some, so I've mentioned some of the costs um, already, things like training, providing training for um, peer or community researchers, maybe thinking about cultural competence training for researchers, particularly as part of fellowships, it's possible to include that in a training plan, um, thinking about covering um, care costs in order to enable people to um, participate, um, providing um, digital devices or um, a fee, um, a payment um, for um, data um, usage is a way of doing it that the NIHR um, recommends. There are also ways that costs can be reduced. So some outcome measures, for instance, have already been translated into a range of different um, languages. It might be that one of those is suitable for your research if you're using that sort of outcome measure. Um, sometimes people will also assume that we just have to translate written documents into a range of languages. It's often not the best thing to do um, with some languages that might um, be effective, but there are other languages that are widely spoken, Punjabi, for instance, but not widely written, not widely read. Um, and rates of literacy might be quite low in that language, depending on the particular group you're trying to target. So in that instance, it would be more cost effective and more inclusive to perhaps develop, you know, short information, um, participant information videos um, that are communicated in a range of languages rather than producing reams of translated um, materials. And the more that we do this, the more that we normalise EDI in research, um, the, um, the the kind of more kind of the less challenging it will become in terms of um, cost implications in the long run. Um, but it, it can feel like quite a challenge at the moment. So some further resources. Um, the NIHR EDI strategy was launched last September for anyone who might be interested in that. And there's also um, some frameworks for designing, more for designing clinical trials by INCLUDE and then the wider NIHR INCLUDE resources. Something else I'd really recommend as well is the ARC Northwest Coast Health Inequalities Impact Assessment Tool. Um, it is kind of more focused on health, um, but it does talk about social inequalities too. Um, and it's useful from the perspective of it's got some quite good content on thinking about impact um, and how you um, kind of move from research findings to impact. Um, so I'd commend that one. And I will um, end there and I'm very happy to invite any questions.